Hi, this is Robert Clotworthy, and you are listening to Oak Island Plus, a discussion of Oak Island and other mysteries from around the world. Here are your hosts, James McQuiston, Oak Island theorist and author, along with John Hamels, PhD and historical researcher. Get the whole story right here, brought to you by Rabbit Hole Investigations. Hey folks, welcome back to part two of episode 12 of Oak Island Plus. Uh, I'm still Doc Hamels and... I'm still Jim McQuiston. <laughs> we hope you enjoyed the first part. I know it was pretty heavy, but it's history that hasn't been discussed anywhere on Oak Island. The Curse or of anywhere. Oak Island. We, we've scoured so many books over the last three months. Oh my gosh. We are the only people presenting this uh, that I know of in history. We're presenting history for the first time in history. And, you know, we're... Uh, anticipating that this might be the biggest show that we've ever done as far as viewership because of the fact that we are going to uh, disseminate it to the Knights of Malta right. since we have a contact with the Knights of Malta in Nova Scotia they've helped with it we've had the two museums help with it and Art Guinness, our friend, mm -hmm. currently has the highest rated show in yes, shows. Over 6, and he's views. been involved in this. So right. everything's points to this eventually growing to be one of our biggest shows. And we can't wait for the Knights of Malta themselves to read about this fantastic history. Okay. So before we start, I'm going to do one more disclaimer one more time. We are doing our very best, very best to respect the culture of the French, the Scottish, the British, the Mi'kmaq. And when we're trying to pronounce certain terms, we're doing our very best. So please, give us a little slack. We're, we're trying to be as authentic as we can, but if we're not saying it quite correctly, we apologize ahead of time, but we are doing it as respectfully as we can. So Jim, are you ready to take it from yes. here? So yes. let's go, part two, here we go. We'll take a look at this first slide. Um, now, the castle on the right, that is Minster Castle, and that's where William Alexander was born and where his children was, were born. Now, where, where is this? That's in Scotland, uh -huh. and uh, actually the first two Freemasons, known Freemasons, were born in that castle. That was built on former Templar land. Hmm. And in that castle is this wall of shields of the Knights Baronet of Nova Scotia. And so they celebrate it still today, this whole knighthood of uh, Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. And so by 1625, how it came about was that William Alexander realized that he would not be able to find, fund and populate his Nova Scotia without some kind of scheme. So working with King James I, who was still the King James VI of Scotland, the two came up with this idea to form the Knights of Nova Scotia, basically as a way to finance this project, and it was to be uh, uh, populated, I guess you would say, mm -hmm. by uh, chiefs of the great clans of Scotland. So Which are symbolized to, with these shields, right? right. And it was wow. meant to be an arm or a fife of Scotland. Mm -hmm. So. Unfortunately for James, he died four days later after this knighthood was officially confirmed. But his son, King Charles, actually knighted all the baronets of Nova Scotia from that 1625 all the way up to 1649 when he was beheaded by all of Oliver Cromwell's men. Oh boy. Uh, now, some Englishmen did eventually join, but there was a lot of uh, complaints about that because it was meant to be... Uh, part of Scotland. And uh, so this, these Knights Baronet families, and this is something that we discovered when we were doing the Masonic Conspiracy book, right. that 90 out of 110 Grand Masters of Freemasonry in Scotland, now I want to repeat that, 90 out of 110 Grand Masters since the beginning of the Grand Lodge of Scotland till today were Knights Baronet families. And including right down to the guy that's the Grand Master today because uh, his, his mother was a Janet Ramsey and the Ramseys have led, we're going to talk about the Ramseys here, but they've led mm -hmm. Scottish Freemasonry <coughs> for all those years. For, for those who are watching right now, if you go back and look at prior episodes, you're going to see 
uh, where we actually talk a lot about the connection of the Templars, the Stonemasons, and the uh, Freemasons, and then the Knights Baronet, and so on. And we connect it all for you. So please, go back and look at those prior shows, and you'll, you'll get a better understanding of what we're talking about, because we're not going to go into great depth today. And it appears that Freemasonry actually began in Scotland with the initiation of uh, two of Alexander's sons and his partner, Al Strachan, on July 3rd, 1634. So it's a pretty specific date, and that comes out of a, a history of the Lodge of Edinburgh. So the original plan was to have 100 Knights Baronet of Nova Scotia. Now, uh, eventually that was increased, but the original plan was 100. Uh, each would receive a large grant of land in Nova Scotia. Each would provide six men of some skill level, like a, a blacksmith or a builder, yeah. a planter. And uh, each knight would pay a fee of 3,000 mercs. Now, we've done uh, currency conversion on that, and it ranges anywhere from 50,000 to 500,000, depending Ooh. on which standards you're using, but it was still a lot of money. And uh, so this uh, map tells us uh, many interesting things. It shows uh, William Alexander's basic grant that shows how uh, Anticosti is circled up at the top. Uh, Liverpool is where a record exists were the red arrows at the bottom, mm -hmm. of William Alexander surveying Nova Scotia. And Doc found that, he actually found the Hermstone from the New Ross Foundation there and corresponded with the museum there. And they gave us quite a bit of help. And uh, so this gives you an idea of what we're talking about. And you can see that Quebec goes all the way down to the end of the river there. By 1627, just two years later, in France, Cardinal Richelieu devised his own competing group, known as the Company of 100 Associates. Well, that's just like the Knights Baronet, yeah, sounds 100 like. 100 Knights Baronet, 100 huh. Associates. Uh, they were known in French as Compagnie des Saints Associés. <laughs> Otherwise known as the Company of 100 Associates. Yeah, right. <laughs> And uh, each associate was to pay 3,000 lires, a similar fee of 3,000 mercs. They were to provide four men of some skill level, hmm. and they were eventually to receive land in Nova Scotia and New France. So uh, this, they were a, a mere image of the Knights Baronet of Nova Scotia. Yeah. And this uh, slide, this <laughs> next slide here, shows company of 100 associates of Nova Scotia, led by French Knights of Malta, and it features a modern Maltese cross right at the bottom. So this just further cements the fact that it was the Knights of Malta that were financing and supporting the 100 associates of Richelieu. The Knights Baronet of Nova Scotia and the 100 associates were basically a mirror image of each other with the same number of men, a similar fee, and a similar goal. And, Doc, paintings exist of the navies of each of these groups. Well, look at that. One from 1631 at the bottom of Maltese ships, and one from 1634, which was on that painting that we Edward Norgate's looked over. Mm -hmm. Now, there's 17 ships roughly at the top, and that's how many ships Alexander sent to Nova Scotia, but that was over a span of six or seven years. That wasn't a fleet all sent at once. But... Uh, one thing that's interesting, and if you ever want to look into this yourself, most paintings, whether they're of ships or uh, of just people, that belong to the Knights of Malta will have the a symbol. It's uh, It'll either say uh, VFGA or, uh, here we go, Votum Fasse a Gratian and Accepted, which meant vows made and graces accepted. And that was their motto. And so if you see old paintings from the 1500s, those are genuine Knights of Malta paintings. But you can see the differences in the ships from the bottom, which are the Knights of Malta, to the top, which are much, much more sophisticated ships of the English. You know, in this next slide, Jim, 
we're going to be looking at the cross, okay? This cross has changed, as we mentioned before, its design over the years. From the creation of the Knights Hospitallers, even predating the Knights Templar, as you mentioned earlier, up to what we now know as the Maltese Cross. But in any case, each example typically has eight points of the cross, two on, on each arm. Two reasons are given for this. One is that these represented the eight Beatitudes of the Catholic religion. The other reason is that the Knights of Malta across Europe were split into eight langas, or tongues, based on the language spoken in each region. Sort of like a dialect, I suppose. By the time Nova Scotia came along, there was no eighth English langa, or langue. What's interesting is that there exists a woodcut from sometime before 1630 showing Louis the 13th, King of France, in a boat with Cardinal Richelieu. Take a look now. Each man is shown wearing a Maltese cross. In this case, they were members of a more elite version of just 100 highly placed members known as the Order of the Holy Spirit. Other images and paintings of Richelieu also show him wearing the Maltese cross, and you can see that in the slide. On the right-hand side there, mm -hmm. he's wearing a Maltese cross. And now we know that he came from a large family of members of the Knights of Malta. Right. And I think that he was embedded in the French government as a representative, as a conspiratorial representative of the Knights of Malta. He mm -hmm. did not want to uh, be openly a Knight of Malta, you know, mm -hmm. but he wanted to direct Knights of Malta because they honestly wanted to make Nova Scotia be a priory of the Knights of Malta, right? A second home, right? So, uh, as noted on, on earlier with uh, William Alexander in his 1632 settlers, uh, they were ousted by a treaty that was devised by Richelieu in which King Charles would receive the second half of his promised dowry. But for the next six years, political battles raged over how much of Nova Scotia should have been given back. And it's been my theory since 2016 that 1632 was the year that the Alexander men buried something on Oak Island, possibly to be retrieved if the tide turned in favor of the Scots again. But the tide didn't turn until many years later. And it may have been that Knights of Malta visited the island, Oak Island, in search of whatever treasure the Knights Baronet may have hidden there. Mm -hmm. And I've shown in my books that the cipher on the 90-foot stone may have had its inspiration from the cipher sheets of Mary, Queen of Scots. Now, she figures into the story quite a bit. She wasn't in Nova Scotia that we know of, although one theorist claims that she was in we're still waiting to hear on that. <laughs> but she was first married to King Francis II of France. They were both very young at the time. And he died in 1560, which was a very critical year for France and England. And she returned to Scotland the following year. And she created her ciphers once uh, she came under pressure from the Protestants in Scotland and in England. And uh, Louis XIII, the king who sent these Knights of Malta to Nova Scotia, was the great-grandson of the brother of her husband. I know it gets crazy, but... Mm -hmm. So Mary's very last letter was to this brother-in-law before she was executed that day. And so there was a very close connection not only between Mary, Queen of Scots, and the French, but also between the French and Scotland in general. And this is probably the only reason that a greater warfare uh, between the knighthoods of Malta and Scotland didn't take place in Nova Scotia. Okay, Jim, now we're going to kind of go back a little bit in the story. So, here we go. Knights of Malta commander Aymar de Chase would preside over New France as lieutenant governor until his death in 1603. Samuel de Champagne then served as lieutenant governor until his death in 1635. In every way but the formal title, Champlain served as governor of New France, a title that had been formerly unavailable to him uh, owing to his non-noble status. He was followed by a knight of Malta, 
Charles Walt de Montmagny as the first true governor of New France. And this slide here that we're looking at shows what they considered their kingdom there, <laughs> which uh, looks an awful lot like looks what very William similar. Alexander Holy cow. considered. Um, so this is, this is confusing. <laughs> So the, the issue was settled as to who owned it mm -hmm. in 1632 when Razzilli captured okay. uh, Andrew Forrester and basically booted them out. Okay, so with the potential Malta link for Champlain through the DuPont family and through Richelieu, it could be argued that the first three leaders of New France were connected to the Knights of Malta. Yep. And as you mentioned, the, when the Scots left Nova Scotia in 1632, they were replaced by the 300 Frenchmen under the leadership of Isaac de Razzilli, a cousin of Cardinal Richelieu, and wouldn't you know it, he too was a Knight of Malta. He is shown on the next slide alongside a memorial placed in his memory at La Have. He was buried at La Have and that monument was put there and it shows very plainly the Knights of Malta symbol on it. Yeah. And he's shown in this drawing, um, obviously a more modern drawing, but he's wearing the symbol on his cloak and he's wearing a neck cross uh, that's the Knight of Malta cross. I have to admit, he's pretty dashing. <laughs> and he's buried just 32 miles by land mm -hmm. uh, from Oak Island, and by land you got to go up and down all kinds of places mm -hmm. to get there. But by water, it's probably less, and it's I'm sure it's like a two or three hour sail over to Oak Island. But we know that he was in Mahone Bay with uh, Nicholas Dennis mm -hmm. talking about islands, which we'll talk about in a minute. So here. let me tell you a little bit more about Isaac. So Isaac de Rizzilli was admitted as a Knight of Malta in the Priory of Aquitaine on January 6, 1605. His mother, Catherine de Villiers, came from the same family as Philippe de Villiers de Isle Adam, Grand Master of Malta from 6, 1521 until Another his death in 1534. Direction. Isaac had a brother named Gabriel, and his nephew, through his brother Claude, were also members of the order. In 1634, Isaac's brother Claude de Brazili was granted Port Royal, uh, by now known as Annapolis Royal. His brother Gabriel invested heavily in the Nova Scotia Acadia settlements, so it wasn't just one night of Malta coming to Nova Scotia, there was tons of them. Tons of them. Uh, on April 29th, 1632, Isaac Razzilli was appointed Lieutenant General of New France by the company of 100 associates, which he was a shareholder. He was also given the title of Viceroy. The company uh, owned the, and administered the North American colony in the French king's name. Although he bore this lofty title, his jurisdiction was to include all of New France as well as Acadia. Razzilli sensibly deferred to Samuel de Champlain, the lieutenant of Cardinal Richelieu, uh, because as Razzilli wrote, Champlain is more competent in colonial affairs. Thus, Champlain was nearly replaced earlier with a Knight of Malta, but it didn't happen. Razzilli proposed that Nova Scotia become a naval station and a training ground for the Knights of Malta, and made this offer in a letter to Fra. Antoine de Paul, Grand Master at Malta from 1623 to 1636 in the beginning of September 1635. And you know, it's quite possible that Rosilli had in mind what is now called Port Medway as the naval station. Why not? Uh, since the original name was Port Malta or Port of the Maltese. And uh, we have more on the significance of this port but Razzilli also noted the excellence of the Deep Heart Harbor at Chibuktu, which is now Halifax. And he wrote about the fact that it was ice-free year-round, which would have made it an ideal spot for a military order with a strong naval tradition. And this is where it gets really interesting, because near Halifax is a carved stone that bears a great resemblance to a Maltese cross. And we're going to speak about this stone and two other ones fairly soon. So Grand Master de Paul responded from Malta in a letter dated February 1636 that he could not finance the naval operation in Nova Scotia because, quote, we are undertaking a fortification in this place, which he meant Malta, that will cost 200,000 crowns before it's perfected, and it is an absolute necessity even more so because we have been threatened since last year by a siege. 
So there'd be no Priory or Naval base at the site of the future Halifax or at Port Medway. Moreover, by the time the reply was received, Red Zilly had already died. He died at the age of only 49 at La Have on July 2nd, 1636. And his, oddly, his uh, death year is often given as 1635, but there's several primary sources that show that it was in 1636. Hmm. And uh, in old uh, records, Rosilli's Maltese neck cross is mentioned, as well as several cloaks that bore the cross of Malta, several silver buttons on his vest displaying the celebrated cross, and six cloaks bearing his coat of arms. And the neck cross and the cloak can be seen in that image of Rizzilli. He, like I said, he was pretty dashing looking. I could yeah. kind of see myself dressed up with that. What do you think? He wasn't in a coonskin <laughs> cap, let's put it that way. <laughs> Curiously, the National Archives of Canada has a paper imprint of Rizzilli's seal, as you can see in this photo, applied to a passport delivered at La Have in 1632 to one Philbert de Ramsey. Brazilian seal is the oldest surviving impression of any seal in Canada. Most probably, Philibert Ramsay was descended from Sir John Ramsay, who spent some 15 years exiled in France. Part of it is a member of a regiment raised by Sir John Hepburn. In any event, Ramsay was part and parcel of the famous Scottish Ramsays, who provided the fifth known Freemason plus a knight baron of Nova Scotia, and several grandmasters of Freemasonry. Can it get any better than that? And one little tidbit that I found out at the last minute mm -hmm. was that the son of Phil, Philibert de yeah. Ramsey, his name was John Baptiste, he entered the military and he's perhaps best remembered in history as the man who actually surrendered Quebec to the British. Oh my in gosh. 1759. It just keeps going. Yes, it just keeps going. <laughs> okay, so, um, let's see. And even more on the Ramseys, this includes the current Grand Master, uh, whose mother is Janet Ramsey, um, and then the Lord um, Dalhousie. Dalhousie, George Ramsey, a former Grand Master himself, founded Dalhousie University just an hour or so from Old Island. I think, don't they go up there from time, time to the university? Yeah, they have, Island? and what's interesting, uh, Doug told me once that, well, Doug and I had an appointment with them for months via email, and then when I went up to the war room, he said, I have a, something bad to report, and they canceled our meeting, and they didn't give me any reason why. Hmm. But he told me at the time that he had heard a tale that Dalhousie University had a whole room full of Oak Island artifacts on shelves. Oh boy. And he said, I'm trying to figure out a way in. And I said, "Get, uh, make friends with the janitor. And then he'll <laughs> pick you up janitor. some night and show it to now, you. Now, when you but say Doug, you're talking about Doug Crow. Doug Crow, yeah. yeah. But the university has been tied to Oak Island in several ways, um, including Freemasonry. The, but the Oak Island Association met there. The Masons met at Dalhousie, and again, Doug told me about this rumor about them having artifacts. Well, it was, in fact, it was George Ramsey, who was the past Grand Master of the Freemasons of Scotland, who founded Dalhousie University. And you can see it's quite the, uh, yeah, quite the building nice. here. Actually commissioned someone to make a precise description of the lots on Oak Island. This was in 1818. And we have his actual letter. It's on the left-hand slide of this, of this slide here. And uh, it has his name on there. He, now, this, remember, this guy was just the Grand Master of the Scottish Freemasons year, just a few years before this. And at the right is uh, one of the early lot maps of Nova Scotia. Well, they didn't do this for any other lot, any other island in mm -hmm. uh, Mahone Bay and Earth. Some people say there are 365, but there's somewhere around at least 360 islands, and Oak Island is the only one that had this done, and this report was commissioned by the former Scottish Grandmaster. So this absolutely ties Oak Island to Freemasonry from the very beginning of these lots. 
And as a side note, Doc noticed that one of the conditions of two treaties between the Scots and the French, uh, where they were leaving or, lose, or they were the losing side, that they had to tear down their fort. Now, I already mentioned that they had to tear down their fort at Port Royal, mm -hmm. but earlier the French were in Scotland as a defenders of Mary, Queen of Scots, and they had to leave, and they were tear, tore, told to tear down their fort. So we have at least uh, you know a few lot a few forts here that had to be torn down, and now we have this building, if you will, on lot five of Oak Island, and they're wondering why was it torn down and why was it filled in. Well, that fits exactly with this phenomenon of the losing right. side having to tear their building down. So let's just and think about this in. just for a second. So let's just say the nice baronet are, con are involved with Oak Island at some point for whatever reason, and then Rosili comes in and he says, I'm supposed to kick you guys out of here, and then he builds what he wanted was a, a priory, a naval uh, outpost or whatever, and then in comes the British again or whatever, yeah. or at some point <laughs> they're saying, you gotta leave, and part of the agreement is you gotta knock down your fort and bury it. So that totally explains why there would be French and English artifacts mm -hmm. and why the building on Lot 5 would be torn down and filled in. And that may not be the reason, but it sure is an enticing is. Uh, scenario it, yeah. for that. So, uh, and as a uh, another Scotchman that was mentioned along with uh, Ramsay mm -hmm. was named Douglas. And uh, it appears to be William Douglas, who was entered uh, into the Malta Order actually on the island of Malta. And how we first found out about him was this uh, kind of a world traveler. He was a character for sure. Uh, named, I read up on him. Yeah, named William Lithgow. He, start, he was a pilgrim, but he ended up traveling the continent quite a bit. And he laid over on Malta on his return from the Holy Land. And there he encountered a fellow Scot, William Douglas, who had fought with the Hospitallers in their naval war against the Turks, eventually being admitted to the order. Well, we went down another rabbit hole and we found that Douglas captained two ships for the Knights of Malta during their sea battles. And he was rewarded with an initiation into the order. And we find among the official records again, these are primary source documents, uh, that sailing out of Honfleur, France, I'm taking a guess at that, yeah, good. was, quote, Gilliam Douglas, who was master of the ship Jehan in 1579 and of the Experience in 1600. So here we have two Scottish families very closely associated with William Alexander and the Knights Baronet of Nova Scotia. In fact, they had members of their families who were Knights Baronet of Nova Scotia and eventually with Freemasonry who are all tied also with the Knights of Malta. Unbelievable. So the presence of the Order of Malta in Acadia did not end with the death of Rosili, who's buried only about 30 miles from Oak Island. One generation later, uh, in 1669, the Chevalier Hector de Dajon de, this was supposed to be your part, Grand Grand Fontaine, Grand, <laughs> Grand Fontaine became the governor of Acadia. And he had served in New France, and it was he accepted the return of Acadia to France following the Treaty of Breda in 1667, and he remained to administer this colony. And then it was uh, Ramsay's mm -hmm. son who had to give Quebec <coughs> back to the English. So it's just this trading back and forth uh, and interactions. Well, we already told you about the two Maltese crosses that we found near Quebec, the one in the museum that was part of a mm -hmm. That was part of a uh, convent originally, and the other one that was in, in Quebec that was part of a headquarters for the Knights of Malta. But there are potential remnants of Knights of Malta crosses in New Scotland or Nova Scotia as well. And let me tell you about it. Let's go to the next slide. In our second episode of Oak Island Plus, we feature the explorations of Art Genis in the wilds of Nova Scotia. One thing Art uncovered was the M-shaped wall overlooking the small port or bay of Port Medway. 
Further research showed that Port Medway was originally Port Maltois, or Port of the Maltese, or Port Malta. The English called it Port Medway. Art explained how the area in front of the stone fort overlooked the bay and was impossible to farm, and so the stacked wall that we talked about in our second episode with him could not have been made up of field stones, you know, clearing the land, um, but must have been built as a defensive wall. Now, in keeping with this idea, another knight of Malta named Villa Ganon attempted a settlement in Brazil, and he wrote that the first thing his men did before moving any items ashore was to build earthen fortifications. The island settled in 1555 is still called Vilganon Island to this very day. Right, Vilganon had been instrumental in saving the young life of Mary Queen of Scots by taking her to France. In 1548, for safekeeping, running a gauntlet of English ships along the way. Thus, he was highly placed as a, a, king, a knight of Malta in France, while also a hero of Scotland. I actually visited, visited Rio de Janeiro in 2022, mm -hmm. and I could see that island, and our guide, who was a major historian there, actually took us, we couldn't go on the island because it's now a military base, mm -hmm. but he showed it to us up close, and that is Vil Vilganon Island that you're seeing on the on the screen there, and he was the one who saved Mary Queen of Scots life. A Knight yeah. of Malta. Yeah, a Knight of Malta. So, um, William Alexander wrote about Vilganon's desire to create a secret estate in America. He wrote about it in his book about Nova Scotia, and it appears that this is why William Alexander wanted to build a secret state at New Ross, Nova Scotia, which I wrote about in mm -hmm. Oak Island and New Ross, that book. And we found out that Bartholomew Gosnell's 1602 settlement also featured a secretly built compound on an island near Cape Cod. So it appears planning a colony necessitated a great amount of secrecy for fear that the enemy would destroy it before a foothold could be established. And Alexander even wrote of his Nova Scotia adventure as being kept a secret which is one reason why mainstream historians, for the most part, don't even acknowledge it, despite a vast amount of evidence that has been uncovered in my book since 2016. In a letter from February 4th, 1624, William Alexander stated that he, quote, fears the business is too much divulged, but hopes it may be managed so as to avoid disgrace should it fail. And uh, the Alexander family talks about this in their tradition. Mm -hmm. The Mi'kmaq oral tradition talks about this. And the history that we've uncovered talks about this. And what's interesting is his partner, his junior partner, you might say, Al Strachan, late in 1622, uh, stole a massive treasure. And that treasure has never been accounted for. But what's interesting is that it appears that it was it received a, like a secret nod of approval from as high up as William Alexander and King James. Mm -hmm. Well, Razzilli landed at La Have and was buried there, as we said, and that's just a relatively short distance from Oak Island. And also, the very first knight baronet in history, his name was Robert Gordon. He was a big intelligence and military guy for the kings. His land was right nearby, too. It was a short sail up to Oak Island. So, it can be seen that this area was not neglected, as many would have us believed, but right. it was, in fact, considered quite important to both knighthoods. Exactly. The uh, knight of Malta, Isaac de Brazili, actually rounded up the final 42 knights, baronet settlers, as you mentioned, and sent them home. This represents an absolute interaction of these two knighthoods. So we don't have to wonder if they ever met each other in the wilds of Nova Scotia. In fact, what I read, Jim, was it was really was very kind and helped. Was, yes. You know, he, he took good care of them. And, you know, it wasn't like, you know, you got to do this. And, you know, you have to take your time, get everything to go, and we're going to send you back. Now, our genus, uh, our man on the ground in Nova Scotia, made the comment that since we know the knights of Malta were at Port Medford, 
Lahave in the future Halifax, it would stand to reason that uh, they would have entered Mahone Bay, which is located between Lahave and Halifax. Well, we now know for sure that Razili did enter Mahone Bay along with his lieutenant named uh, Nicholas Dennis, who had sailed to the coastline for years. Uh, in his later life, Dennis wrote a detailed description of what he had encountered, and he tells us that he and Razili were escorted into Mirlagash Bay by natives, presumably Mi'kmaq. Dennis states that the bay is about three leagues from the ocean to the back of the bay, which would be a little over ten miles. Mahone Bay fits that description. Dennis also states that the bay that they enter was full of islands, uh, and that also describes Mahone Bay, which has about, what, you told me, 365. Now, in a story about an island in Mahone Bay that was off limits to the Mi'kmaq due to it causing itching, this is a funny story, as soon as anyone set foot on it, Dennis again mentions Razili saying, I was in this bay with Monsieur de Razili, and, uh, the natives who were driving and who told us about an island that they never set foot on. Having asked the reason, they replied that when a man sets foot in the vegetation of the isle, that at the same time a fire, or in this case itching, took to his parts, and that they burned. <laughs> he says, I laughed, and even more so when Commander Razili told a Franciscan father, aged around 50 years, not to go there. That's a cute story, and uh, the thing about it is it shows that they were in Mahone Bay talking about islands. And Razili also mentions that beaver pelts were brought down a river, now called Gold River, from an area called New Ross to be traded in the bay, now called Mahone Bay. So since William Alexander and his son had previously been granted rights to all beaver pelt trading, it is almost certain that they built their estate at New Ross in order to be close to the resource where they were finding all these beavers to trap or kill otherwise. And since Oak Island is located near the mouth of Gold River, it is also likely that Oak Island was the station for this fur trade, explaining again both Mi'kmaq and European artifacts being found near the Oak Island swamp, along with the cloth, bale, or bag mm -hmm. seal, the mm -hmm. trading items, the weight, the measuring weight. So um, there's at least one more possible Maltese cross not far from Oak Island and perhaps two. Near Halifax is an area called Bedford Barrens and there is a stone there most often referred to as a Mi'kmaq petroglyph and this has been featured on the Curse of Oak Island and Chris Bowes and Brent Salins have been deeply studying this stone for evidence. Uh, they feel that it has some kind of connection to the equinoxes and other heavenly activities. Well, Chris provided some of the images that we're about to view, and I want to thank him for that. And he works with David Deason, who we oh, interviewed yeah. last time around. And while we take a little bit different tack uh, on what the, what the stone was, we look forward to their published work, which they are going to have out in a month or so. Mm -hmm. Now, this carving uh, lays out a perfect Maltese cross. As you can see, uh, at the left is the carving. At the right is a Maltese cross that I laid over the angles of that are carved into the stone. And uh, we are not the first Oak Island theorists to point this out. But if you take the known drift of magnetic north, which is on our next slide here, I've laid out the drawing to be north-south axis on the left-hand side of this paper. And Chris even calls it the eight-point star, which is the Maltese cross. So uh, I put a green line on what would appear to be the center of a Maltese cross. I found this chart that's on the right that shows the drift of magnetic north. And I picked up the green line and the red line. I copied them and I pasted them on top of the drift and they fit exactly. They fit better than I ever thought they would fit. 
So uh, there's no manipulation to this. This is the trajectory of the stone, and this is the trajectory of magnetic north from 1632 up to curtain times. And what that does, as you can see in the center, it puts magnetic north right through the middle of a Maltese cross. So you felt that this particular symbol was like a compass? Yeah, I feel it's a Maltese cross to, mm -hmm. to, to mark mm -hmm. them being there. And uh, we know for a fact that they were in Halifax Bay because none other than uh, Razzilli mm -hmm. wrote about it and right. wrote about how great of a naval base it would right. be for the Knights of Malta. Uh, so, so there's one other curious uh, element on the stone that matches reasonably similar to an uh, element on a stone on Oak Island. Uh, we've called this carving a squiggle for the lack of a scientific uh, name for it. But on the left, you can see that it's just below the words H and O on the H.O. stone, the famous H.O. stone right. from Oak Island. Mm -hmm. And it's also off to the right and below this other image on the Bedford Barron stone. Okay, so two different stones. Two different stones, but a very similar, all the way to the right, you can see how similar the the drawings are. And uh, so no one proposes that I've ever heard that the H.O. stone was an indigenous carving, and yet both have a similar squiggle. Mm -hmm. And the H.O. stone can also be connected to the Knights of Malta, which we're going to do that in a minute. So uh, there's some very curious information there about that stone. And again, we were not the only Oak Island, Oak, Oak Island theorist to ever say that that was a Knight of Malta cross. But also at New Ross, where the foundation is, uh, we received this drawing from the owners of New Ross, I mean this photograph of the Herm stone. And in an episode of Oak Island, they had uh, transposed a cross over it saying it was a Templar cross. But particularly on the left hand side of it, you can see where the edge of the cross curves in like a Maltese cross. So right. I placed a Maltese cross over it. Do you think that they they get the Maltese cross and the Templar cross mixed up? Perhaps? Yes, I think that quite often that happens. And uh, so uh, I actually ran this by two people that have studied the stone up close and they both agree that it could be a Maltese cross as easily as it could be any other kind of cross. And what was really cool about it was they told us where they had taken it to a museum in Liverpool, I believe, right? Mm -hmm. And Doc, on his own, went ahead and contacted <laughs> them and <laughs> said, hey, can you photograph that stone for us? Oh, they were super about it. So this next slide here is the actual Hermstone from Nova Scotia and from New Ross, Nova Scotia. Queens, and uh, Queens County Museum. Mm -hmm. So uh, obviously if we could uh, take a lot closer look at it, you know, have a geologist or somebody like that take a closer look, we might be able to see the carving either be even better. But it's certainly a possibility that that was a Maltese cross carved on that stone. And so you might say, well, why would a Maltese cross be up at New Ross? And uh, it's easily explained because, as I mentioned in the beginning of uh, part one, mm -hmm. William Alexander had given all of that Mahone Bay area to Charles and Claude de la Tour. Right. And the Alexander family says they moved out in 1630, the same year as that deed. They didn't move back until 1641. So uh, it could make sense that uh, that Maltese cross was placed there once the French took over yeah, New Ross. back and forth. The New Ross forth. building, because as we're pointing out, mm -hmm. back and forth is the perfect word for this. It's just everything's trading back and forth, back and forth, mm -hmm. until they're finally booted out in 1632. And because the deed read, into the lands and seas 14 leagues, which is about 52 miles above La Have, this would put all of Mahone Bay and all the seas around it, uh, all probably all the way up to New Ross, in the hands of these Frenchmen. 
And so uh, this is supported by Mi'kmaq oral traditions. I actually talked to the man who helped Joan Harris Hope uh, write her book and do the discoveries of the foundation mm -hmm. at New Ross. I talked to him. In fact, I asked him, how, why did you know all this? And he said, my grandfather chose me to be the carrier of the oral traditions of the Mi'kmaq, wow. and I had to study for three years and prove to him that I could recite it. tell the story. He yeah. said, now I can't tell you if all the stories are correct or anything, but I can tell you that this is what I was told. Mm -hmm. And the Alexander family has quite a bit online about their story, which matches the Mi'kmaq story. So this uh, fact that a Knight of Malta cross could be on that stone mm -hmm. at the New Ross Foundation makes, makes absolutely good sense. sense. Yeah. And uh, Nicholas Dennis, who we talked about, who mm -hmm. was in Mer Merlegash Bay with Rosilli, he, he wrote, quote, this is another uh, primary source, mm -hmm. <laughs> we found the river of Merlegash, which gives its name to this bay. It is deep and extends well further inland. Now, how would he know this unless they traveled up Gold River? He wouldn't know that it was deep and extended far inland. Mm -hmm. And I actually talked to a sportsman up there in Nova Scotia who told me that it was navigable before the gold mining started. Okay. And uh, so, again, how would he know it unless he was up there looking for those First deeper hand, lakes? Yeah. Uh, since Rosilli didn't arrive in Nova Scotia until 1632 and he died in 1636, we know absolutely uh, that these men were at Gold River, which is right next to Oak Island, in Mahone Bay sometime during those years. Maybe they were there many times, but we know they were there at least once. And Dennis wrote that they had made divers voyages, or many voyages, along the coast and inland, so they can could have been back and forth to Oak Island and Mahone Bay wow. many times. Right it's there. just not recorded, mm -hmm. other than what Dennis, thank God, mm -hmm. wrote. But is there any evidence of a Maltese cross on Oak Island? That's well, the question. Well, our next few slides, Jim, may prove that there is. One of the commonly mentioned artifacts from the island, as you already hinted at, is the H.O. stone. In the center of this stone is a symbol of a cross with four smaller objects in each corner of the cross. This has been interpreted in many ways. One of the eight points of the Maltese cross represents the Langa or Langu or branch of the Knights of Malta from Provence, France. These knights had their own style of cross, which was a large cross with smaller crosses in each corner. There are several architectural elements and even a postage stamp that you can see that shows this unique Knights of Malta symbol from Provence. What makes this even more interesting is that Samuel Champlain's uncle mentioned in his quote about his first job as a ship's captain was Guillaume Alain de le Capitaine Provençal of Provençal, or in English, William Allen, Captain of Provence. The H.O. stone also features the oddly shaped carving which highly resembles one found, as you already mentioned, on the Bedford Barons petroglyph. Again, no one equates the H.O. stone with Mi'kmaq artifacts, and yet both stones have a very similar drawing, and both stones can be connected to the Knights of Malta through their unique crosses. It's absolutely amazing. One scenario is that Andrew Forrester and his companions stayed behind on Oak Island to finish burying the treasure that was left behind by Alexander's Knights of Baronet settlers, and then they returned back to Port Royal, where they were eventually captured. Mm -hmm. um, but perhaps they were directed to go back to Oak Island and tear that fort down on Lot 5 and bury it, which would explain that. And we know Razili landed uh, just about 30 miles from Oak Island, and it, he's actually buried there. And uh, perhaps he was looking for the Scots treasure that they knew that had been generated because they copied it by creating the hundred associates. All right. They copy the exact pattern. So obviously there's questions still to be answered, which I'm sure we'll be doing for another year. <laughs> uh, but we know that many artifacts on Oak Island uh, that fit the early 1600s 
show a burst of activity, and both French and English artifacts have been uncovered, and it seems very likely that the activities of these two dueling knights, the Knights Baronet of Nova Scotia and the Knights of Malta, could have easily spilt over onto Oak Island, which was nearby a lot of this activity. So certainly their known histories in Nova Scotia surround Oak Island. So let's, let's bring it all together, Jim. We hear a lot about the Knights Templar being in Nova Scotia, and yet, as far as we know, there's no accepted proof of this so far. But where have you ever heard about the Knights of Malta being there? Right. <laughs> and yet, there's an overabundance of proof that mm, they were there, along with the Knights Baronet of Nova Scotia that we've talked about for 11 episodes. The connection of these knighthoods shows, once again, that the story of Oak Island and of early Nova Scotia is much bigger than nearly all other historians and researchers have done so far, other than us, and have ever spoken about or even accepted as a possibility. You never hear about these guys uh, on the show. Nope. It's so anyway. important, it's so important, i, I got to reiterate that, to take time to test each notion that comes along with primary sources, as we have, and to be sure that they fit a real timeline that supports the ideas uh, being suggested. And folks, we have painstakingly done quite this. Yes, we take pride in the fact that we go to historic sources, primary if possible. We talk about real people that are recorded in history. We talk about real events and we show real documents. We're not looking at the stars and making something up. We're taking the history and relaying it to you folks. Uh, we still, like I say, have a lot to sort out and we'll continue down this road. But uh, that's what Oak Island Plus is all about. For those that are, went to our Facebook page and saw a little uh, bird spinning around, a couple people picked up that it was a Maltese falcon, so that was the clue for this, this month's episode. I want to thank Randy Bird, our cameraman, as yes. always, that's on the other side of, the, of, of us, uh, that helps us out every month, and of course, uh, Innovation Studios for uh, allowing us to film here in Westfield. I'm Doc Hamels, and I want to thank you all for watching our episode 12, part 2, of uh, Oak Island Plus. Spread the word, Oak Island Plus, where the real history is. And please Jim subscribe. Jim saying goodbye. And I'm Doc Hamels. Take care now. This is Robert Clotworthy, and you have been listening to Oak Island Plus, a discussion of Oak Island and other mysteries from around the world. Be sure to catch every episode.